Hi, I'm Pastor Ellis, and thanks for joining us in worship today. We're reaching people from all over the world, and we're so glad that you're a part of that community. Hit the like button or drop a comment. We'd really like to get to know you a little better. God bless you. It was 1861, the beginning of the Civil War. Julia Howe was challenged to write new lyrics to a familiar march tune. Well, the very next morning, she woke up before dawn with the words streaming through her head. She says she got up, quickly found a piece of scrap paper, and scribbled out the words that we know today as the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Well, those words remind us of who Jesus is. And that one day, the angel armies will blow the trumpet, time will be no more, and Jesus will return for his church. But until then, his truth is marching.
are glad you're here. Uh, I want to start with two passages of scripture real quick, and then I want to uh, welcome you in a couple of other things. Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And then uh, 2 Corinthians 3.17 says this, now the, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Aren't you glad that we live in a country where we're free to celebrate, to worship, to read God's Word together, and to express what is in our hearts through the Spirit of the Lord? Thank you, Lord, for the freedom we have in this country. Yes. And we're glad you're here today. Uh, some, some of you may be guests first time. Uh, it may have been a long time since you've been back. I want you to know how welcome you are. If in the intervening time, if you've come back after a while and somebody has claimed your seat, see me later. Um, I'll help you get that straightened out, but we are glad you're here. If you are our guest, we'd love to know so that we can follow up with you, just an email or a text. If you'll just text the word connect, to that number, uh, we would love to follow up with you and uh, welcome you personally. Also, if you are not yet connected to a group, groups are where we express the life of this church. It's where you build great relationships. It's where we study God's word together. Uh, right now, all together, we're uh, reading a chapter a day in the well. If you do not have a copy of this, any of those reasons, if you'll stop by that welcome desk right behind me out in the lobby, uh, we would love to give you one of those and get you connected to a group. One last thing, uh, we so appreciate your faithfulness in giving. This church is absolutely amazing. There are multiple ways you can give. You can text GIVE to that same number, uh, or there are some giving boxes with envelopes out in the lobby. Any way that uh, feels comfortable to you, we just appreciate your faithfulness in giving. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for what you've done in us and through us and for this great and grand privilege we have to worship you, sing praises to you uh, in this free country. Father, I pray that we would remember the cost of that freedom and that we would do everything that we can to protect it. Father, we trust in you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christ, we are one. Let's stand together and sing that truth. Being of one mind, having the same love, being of one accord, having the same heart, believing in one God, following one truth, believing in Jesus. Yeah. 
Christ shares with us his grace, his love, and we find freedom in him. Let's read about that together from the book of Romans. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. We have that freedom because of God's great, amazing grace. Let's sing about it together.
Worshiping God this morning. Thank you for joining us online. We're so grateful that you're here and a part of our worship today as well. We find ourselves in the Gospel of Luke this week, Luke chapter 3. And I'm going to read verses 1 to 20. If you want to open your Bibles there and get ready. If you don't have your Bible, it'll eventually be on the screen. When my kids were younger, Priscilla in some ways was a single mom every Sunday, um, having to get the kids ready Sunday morning. I was already at church, uh, having to uh, get them to church get them to Sunday school, pick them up after Sunday school. We would, the kids would worship with us in the worship services in the church I was pastoring at that time in McAllen. And so she had to keep them still during the worship service. Cause you know, everyone was watching the pastor's kids, right? As an example. And so she had to keep them still in the service, all, all that by herself. In that particular church, we were on television. Um, we were on the local Fox network affiliate there in the Valley. And the, broadcast it would be the sermon would be broadcast on Sunday afternoon so Priscilla would do what any red-blooded American mom would do in that situation she would threaten the kids uh, to keep them quiet right that's what you do you threaten them and her threat was if you don't be still during dad's sermon I'm gonna make you go home and watch him on television this <laughs> afternoon she oh no no mom not that anything but that and every Sunday we had a tradition of going to lunch after after church together just as a family at lunch, Priscilla would always ask the kids, as they grew up, she would ask them, what did dad preach about today? See if they were listening, right? What did dad preach about? At some point, the kids got old enough and wise enough, they figured Jesus was a safe uh, <laughs> answer, right? So every Sunday, what did dad preach on? He preached on Jesus. And 99.9% .9 of the time, they would have been right. But not today. Because today, I'm actually preaching on John the Baptist. They would have gotten it wrong. We're looking at John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 20, this instrumental figure in Christian history. John the Baptist, Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. Let's read there. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Idria and Traconitus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to son, John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him, Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth. And all people, all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should, should share with the one who has none. 
and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into its barn, and he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added, them, added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Um, one of the greatest natural disasters, well, the greatest natural, natural disaster in U.S. history was actually a hurricane in 1900 that hit the coast of Texas at Galveston Island, killing 8,000 people. The great hurricane of 1900, it, uh, it stands more than 100 years later still as the most devastating natural uh, disaster in U.S. history. Galveston is about nine feet above sea level. The wind surges took it took the waves up to 15 feet above sea level. Um, something like $649 million of today's money uh, in damages and 8,000 people, men, women, and children, perished. That was about 20% of Galveston's, popula Galveston's population at that time. It is one of the greatest natural disasters in U.S. history in terms of, of lives lost, not because it was the most devastating hurricane, not because it was the greatest hurricane. It was a Category 4 hurricane. Winds came up to 145 miles an hour. There have been bigger hurricanes. There have been more devastating type hurricanes. There have been category five hurricanes, greater winds. It's, it's not because it was the worst or, or greatest hurricane, but rather because most of the people in Galveston didn't even know it was coming. They didn't have the same warning systems that we have today. And by the time they found out it was too late, too late. <laughs> this is what we see in the story of John the Baptist. This is the, the compelling force behind the life of John the Baptist. It is simply this, that there are some things that to know them demands that you say something. There are some things that to have the information requires you, demands that you tell, that you share, that you say something. That's what John is doing when we find him here. John, John was in many ways a bridge from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, under the law to the new covenant, the new testament, under the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He was kind of this bridge figure. When they describe him, he, he looks and feels and acts and lives like one of the Old Testament prophets, a voice calling in the wilderness. He is this bridge figure between the old and the new. He looks like an Old Testament prophet, yet he has a New Testament message. He has a new vision for what the Messiah was, was going to look like, you see. And, and the people had been waiting for the Messiah for, for centuries. In some ways, the Hebrew people, when John comes onto the scene, have been living in a type of slavery for, for more than 400 years. For more than 400 years, the Hebrew people had lived under the heel of one oppressor after the other. First it was the Assyrians, then it was the Babylonians, and then it was the, the Persians, and then it was the Macedonians, the Greeks, and then ultimately, finally, the Romans. One oppressor after another had, had beaten down the Hebrew people, and they were, they were longing for, they were looking for, they were hungry for this Messiah who would come, as John says, with fire. And John is in the wilderness to tell them the big message 
the important message, the thing that to know it demands that you say something. He says, he's coming. In fact, he's here. And John tells them that, that this Messiah is, is coming and he is coming with fire and the fire is going to start with them, the very people of God, the very ones who are waiting for the Messiah. He says, he's coming to you and he's bringing the fire to you. Now, that wasn't what they were expecting. They weren't expecting that at all. In fact, they had been praying for God to throw down the fire and brimstone on the Romans for a long time. You don't, you don't want God's fire to fall on you. You want God's fire to fall on the enemy. He is supposed to bring the fire to the enemy, to the bad guys, to the Gentiles. And John comes with this revolutionary message. No, the fire is coming first to you, to the children of Abraham. They say, well, what can we do to escape the fire? You can't. You can't escape the fire. He says, be sure, this is, this is the critical line in his message, be sure that your fruit is in line with your repentance. He is calling them to repentance. He says, be sure that your fruit is in line with your repentance. And he says, and don't think that just because you're children of Abraham that you're going to get away with it, that you're going to escape the fire. Don't think that just because you were born a Jew means that you're automatically going to escape the fire. You're not. It's coming to you first. I think it was Billy Graham who was fond of saying, just because you were born in a garage doesn't make you a car. <laughs> so just because you were born in the church doesn't make you a Christian. John was saying, just because you were born a child of Abraham doesn't make you a child of God. You will not escape. He says to them, be sure that your fruit is in keeping with your repentance. And the word for repent simply means, it literally means to turn. It's an act of the volition. It's an act of the will. It's a choice that you make. I'm going to turn from this way of living and I'm going to turn to Jesus and his way of living. It is, a, is it an act of the will. And he says, once you have made that choice and that choice you will make one way or another to live this way or to live this way or to live that way. Once you choose to live for Jesus, then be sure that the fruit that is coming out of your life is in keeping with that decision that you have made to turn to Jesus. Be sure that the fruit, you see. So the, the crowds are asking, well, what do we do? What, what does that look like? What does he say to them? Share. Share what you have. If you have two shirts, give one away. You only need one shirt. None of y'all need to look in my closet about that, all right? Because uh, I have more than one shirt. Share. If you have enough food for a me two meals, then give one away. You share. In other words, you care about the other. This is how the, the tax collectors came to him and said, well, what, what should we do? He says, don't collect more than what you absolutely have to collect. This is what the way the tax collectors would do it. They had to collect a certain amount for Rome, and, but they would collect oh, whatever they could get and beat out of the people over and above that went to them. He says, you don't need to do that. Do not enrich yourself off of the bloodied backs of your own people. Share. Share. Even the soldiers came to him and said, what, what, what should we do? He says, he says don't, don't extort people. Don't, don't uh, oppress people. Don't use your position of authority to beat people down. Share. Be happy with what you're getting paid because the soldiers would extract even more out of the people because of their authority, because of the club. He says, don't do that. He says again and again, it's, it's share, you see. Because... The Messiah is coming. Jesus is coming with his fire. John says, I baptize you with water, but he will come and he will baptize you with water. And the difference between, between the purifying and cleansing effects of water and fire is that fire burns away all that is not needed and it's permanent. That's the image of verse 17. Where he said he's clearing the floor with the shaft, all the shaft, everything that is extra, everything that is unnecessary will be burned away and only that which is real will remain. This is what Jesus does. He comes and he brings fire to our lives, burning away everything that is not real. And it's a permanent 
It's a permanent cleansing, a permanent purifying. So what I want to do just out of this, out of this moment with John the Baptist, I want to just pull out a couple of things that I think he's telling us, about some of the ramifications of this fire that's coming to our, that comes into our lives. Each and every one of us has experienced this fire that has burned away everything that is not real, leaving only, thing that, is, only that, it, that which is Jesus. What I want to do is I want to talk about a couple of things that that the ramifications of that. The first is this, that you, you have to let go of your past in order to embrace your future in Jesus. You have to let go of your past sins, your past mistakes, your past, your past regrets, your past struggles. As it turns out, finding forgiveness from God may be the easiest part of this journey. Forgiving ourselves is a lot harder. Asking for forgiveness from those that we've hurt is a lot more difficult. Jesus, Jesus takes all of your sins and all of your struggles and all of your regrets and all of your past and he takes it and the Bible tells us he buries it in the deepest sea and, he, and it says, watch this, and, the, and God remembers it no more. It's a holy amnesia, a divine kind of amnesia that only God can do is that he takes everything from your past and he buries it in the deepest sea and says he remembers it no more. God forgets. We're the ones who remember. Letting go of your past sins, your past mistakes, your past regrets. This is what the cleansing fire wants to do with your life. It wants to cleanse you, it wants to burn all that up, leaving only that which is Jesus. The second thing is to be grateful for what we have. Be grateful for what you have instead of regretting what you don't have. There is, there is something about the way that we are socialized that works against this for us. Because we are socialized to, to win, to succeed, to work hard every day and work hard and work hard and work hard for our goals. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But we've been socialized to, to win and to be first and to work hard to, to get that, to, to reach for that, that golden ring, to, to chase after daily that, that, bet, that bigger, better deal. And we've become so socialized to do that that we never take time, it seems, to stop and to be grateful for what we have. Instead of continuously, day in and day out, chasing what we don't have, to be grateful for what we have. A number of years ago, uh, the church graciously gave me a sabbatical I think it was my 10-year anniversary here, and they gave me a one-month sabbatical. Um, Y'all voted to do that in case you don't remember. Uh, <laughs> and I'm very grateful for that, because I was coming to a place in my ministry, in my life, where I was uh, experiencing a certain amount of burnout. And I didn't even realize, I didn't even realize how overwhelmed I was, how tired I was, how beat down I was. I didn't even realize it until I got away got alone with God. It's then that I realized something about the way I'd been living my life. Priscilla will get mad at me because she told me this all the time, but I didn't listen. It's this drive to always more and more and more, and nothing is enough. Nothing, where nothing, is, what, nothing is ever really enough. When, when is it, when, when do you get to the place where enough is enough? And you can just sit in your thankfulness and gratitude for what you have instead of continuously regretting or chasing after what you don't have. This is, this is what John is saying to them. He's saying to them, look, they're saying, what can we do? He says, you, you share what you have. You be it means to be grateful for what I have. And, and the, the natural consequence of being grateful for what you have is to share it with others, isn't it? The natural consequence of being full and having gratitude for your life is that you want to share that life 
to share that life with others. Some Christians are living such a life, they're living such a life chasing and chasing and chasing, never satisfied, never happy with what they have. They're living such a life that who would, who would want that life if you want to share that with me? I don't want that life. But when, you, when you're grateful for what you already have, then you naturally share it. Be grateful for what you have instead of regretting what you don't have. And then finally, he says, and I've already touched on this, you have to be willing to share what you have been given. It's in my experience through my life that most of us, honestly, most of us end up giving God and others, including our own family, we end up giving them the leftovers of our life. This is something actually that sociologists have studied quite intensely in our culture and our society with uh, mothers and fathers and, and their children, uh, where there was a time in our culture, in our, in our country, when we were very agricultural, very rural in our, in our nation. And children, oftentimes at a certain age, worked alongside their father or their mother in the fields. The children helped on the, on the family farm, right? And, and so they would spend their days, many of their days, right next to their father, watching him working in the fields and working alongside him, or, or, or with their mother working in the fields or in the house, working with her, watching her. In other words, they spent, the children would spend time watching their father doing what he did best, farming. Their mother doing what she did best. In other words, they were getting the best of their parents. They were the parents, and, and in those days, the parents would pour into their children as they worked. They would teach them life lessons about work, about, about relationships, about life, as they worked together on the family farm. And then what happened with the Industrial Revolution, and then later with the Technological Revolution, it has splintered those times together, hasn't it? The Industrial Revolution took, first of all, the father out of the home, going to the, to the plant to work all day long, away from his family. And he would come back home at night, and he would get to spend maybe an hour with his children, but at that hour, what were they getting? They were getting their father tired and frustrated and, 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 and not tired of, of talking, and so they, they, got, they got what? The leftovers of their father because he had spent his day at the, at the plant, at the factory, working. You understand? And the same with, with the mother, you understand? It's this, it just began to splinter those relationships. And then with the technological revolution, right? We can be in the same room and not talk to each other. My kids text me from the other room. They prefer to talk to me that way. Most days I prefer to talk to them that way too. So what do they get when we do spend time with them? They get tired, frustrated mom, tired, frustrated dad. They get the leftovers. They get the crumbs. I grew up in that culture, but I was, I was very fortunate and that at a very young age, I went to work with my dad. He was a framing contractor, and I went to work with him the summers, every, every, every day of the summers. Hated it. Hated it, working in the hot sun. But now I look back and I cherish those moments, those days, because I got to see my dad commanding the troops, le leading his men to build this, this house. I got to see him pouring over the, the blueprints, and I got to see his mind working. I got to see my dad at his best. If I had just been at home waiting for him to come home, I would have seen him at his worst, the frustrated dad, the tired dad, but I got to see him at his best. And my children, my children growing up, got to see their dad preaching from the pulpit. They got to see the fruit of my whole, all my week of work. They got to sit there in the worship service and, and hated it. <laughs> but those will be someday when I'm dead and gone, some of the most cherished memories of their life, won't it? watching dad at his best. See, I think much of the time what we end up giving to God and to the people we love are the leftovers, the crumbs at the end of the day. And here, 
is saying you have to you have to give God your best. This the idea, the Hebrew idea that's played into this, this text, the Hebrew idea of the first fruits, you see. When they talked in the in the Hebrew culture about giving to God, they called it the first fruits. Because you were supposed to give the very first part of your day, the very first part of your efforts, the very first part of your crops, the very first part of your cattle. All the the best part is the part that you give to God first and to the people you love first. And then whatever is left is for yourself. Amen? You you understand what I'm saying here is that, that we have to be willing to share, to share our very best. And there are certain cultures in the world that just, I'm afraid, get that better, perhaps, than we do. Um, that's my experience. But I was in seminary, and uh, my last year in seminary went to a, on a mission trip to Torreon, Mexico. And um, we were going there to preach a series of revivals at this church in Torreon. Torreon is a, is a city. It's, it's a largest city. It's not... It's not Mexico City, but it's, it's a city. And it's out in, in the middle of the desert. I mean, out in the middle of nowhere. So we traveled out there, and uh, we did a series of revivals. I was preaching uh, in Spanish. So it wasn't good, but <laughs> I tried. And a friend of mine that went on the trip as well, he was leading the music. So my friend Jesse was leading the music. I was, I was preaching. And they had us stay with a family from the church. It was a young family. Um, They seemed old to me, but I was in my 20s. And they had two little kids. They had to have been young. And uh, they had, uh, there were, actually, they had three children. There were five in the family. And it was a three, little three-bedroom house. The bedrooms were very small. The house was very, very humble. It was, it was, uh, well, by American standards, it just wasn't very nice. But but it's what they had. And I remember uh, going to stay there, and we had our suitcases, my friend and I, and uh, I remember the family, the mother and father, insisting against our protestations. We we protested, but they insisted that each one of us would get our own room, and the entire family, mom, dad, and the three kids, stayed in one bedroom so that we could have our own bedroom. I said, no, you don't have to do that. That's, that's not, really, you don't, I'll sleep on the couch. Really, I'm a seminary student. I sleep on the couch half the time anyway. No, they insisted. This was their idea. Of, and they told us, we don't have much. We don't have much. But what we have, we want to give to you. This is what John the Baptist is saying. This, this, is, this is what it looks like for your fruit to look like your repentance, to, for, the, for the fruit of your life to look like, like what you claim about Jesus Christ, right? This is what John is warning us about, and his warning is a, is a frantic-sounding kind of warning. You hear it, the axe is at the root of the tree, trees are going to start falling, Messiah is coming, Re- fire is going to rain down, and, and you, you better be ready. This is, this is a, what he is doing, I know it sounds harsh, it sounds harsh. I don't like reading John the Baptist, he's really, really mean. Brood of vipers. Get your life. But I want you to see, this is a message of love. This is, a, this is a, an urgent message of what we know to be true when you, live, when you live with Jesus. When Jesus is the center of your life and all of your life begins to, to, to uh, like a constellation, to center itself on the life of Jesus. We understand what this life looks like in comparison to the life lived out there. We understand the glory of it, the beauty of it, the graciousness of it, the fulfillment of it, that there is nothing more fulfilling than living for Jesus. And when we understand that, that is, that is a message, that is, a, that is a, an idea that to know it, to know it demands that you say something. John's heart was on fire because he knew, he knew Messiah was coming and that message demands that you say something. Say something. A couple years ago, I went with my family to, the, to Oklahoma City 
of course, in Oklahoma City, there's a lot to see, actually. But, of course, you go to the memorial at the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building out on the front lawn. One of the survivor's tree that's there. One of my most favorite trees. One of my most favorite trees in the whole world is in Oklahoma City, the survivor's tree. And all the chairs. Timothy McVeigh, who built the bomb and detonated it and killed all those people, he was convicted and he was given the death penalty for that horrible act of terrorism. Only one other person was convicted in that, and it's Terry Nichols. And he was given life in prison. It's interesting. The only person that I know of, and you can Google check me if you want to, but the only person I know of who was given a life sentence in prison who didn't do anything. He he didn't build the bomb. He didn't deliver the bomb. He didn't detonate the bomb. He'd never even been in Oklahoma City. But Terry Nichols was convicted and given life and sentence simply because he knew about the bomb and he didn't say anything. There are some things that to know them demands that you say something. You should have said something. This is the lesson of John the Baptist. This thing that we have, this freedom we have in Jesus Christ, this release from our sins and our mistakes and our regrets, this cleansing fire that burns away from our lives everything that is not Jesus, this life that we get to live in Jesus Christ, to have that, to know about that, demands that you say something. It demands that we say something. Amen. Father, we thank you for loving us, for giving again and again and again. You never stop giving to us. We pray that you would just speak with us now and just touch our hearts and our lives the way only you can. We love you today, Father. We honor you today. We're so thankful for the celebration that we celebrate today. We, all, over, all over our nation, there are celebrations going on because it is Independence Day, and we are grateful for that. We are ever grateful. We don't ever want to take for granted the freedom we have, the people who sacrificed, laid a foundation for our freedoms. Help us to ever be true and vigilant to that. But Father, we understand also that we are not just citizens of this world. We were citizens of heaven as well. We have a dual citizenship, Father, and we just help us, Father, to to love people in such a way that they see the message in our lives. They see Jesus. Help us to say something. Help us to change this world for your honor and your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pray that God has blessed you today, and I pray that you have a glorious day celebrating with your family. And as you go through your day, I pray that you will be able to share with someone that sometime this week that you'll be able to tell them about what Jesus has done for you.
Thanks for joining us in worship today. I pray that God has blessed you in a special way, and I can't wait to see you again next Sunday.